Um, today, we are privileged to welcome Dr. Um, Karina Marquez and Dr. Vivek Jain. Dr. Marquez is an associate professor in our division and directs the Salud Clinic at Ward 86, which provides multidisciplinary care to Latinx folks. Um, Dr. Jain is also an associate professor in our division and directs the Infectious Disease Clinic. They are both fantastic infectious disease and HIV clinician educators. I always learn so much from them, um, and we're really honored that they are coming here today to talk about challenging cases among people living with HIV from the ID clinic. So please warmly welcome them. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for having us. Uh, great to see you all. Just glancing around who else here. Wonderful. Okay, so um, we're gonna uh, share the session today and talk about um, some patients that we've taken care of in ID clinic. Um, and just dive right in. These are my disclosures. They are not related to this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna take the first um, half hour or maybe 20, 25 minutes and um, do a little bit of a dive into um, the drug Dalbavancin, which, um, Maybe just quick show of hands, have people heard of this drug or used it ever? Okay, wow, it's about two thirds, great. Um, which is a new antibiotic that is really expanding our therapeutic strategies for a lot of different conditions um, in ID, um, specifically bacterial, gram-positive bacterial infections. Um, and these occur at a fairly high clip in our HIV-positive patients, especially folks um, with substance use um, uh, intravenous substance use, um, who, who have a much higher rate of skin and soft tissue infections. So I'm going to just give a brief overview of some Dalbavance in clinical trials and some emerging evidence and talk about how we're using it. Um, illustrating that with some patients we've taken care of here, um, and then give a, a quick perspective on implementation. Um, I'm really privileged. I just want to put this at the beginning. This is our ID clinic team. And I wanted to acknowledge and thank um, Karina, who's associate director of our clinic, and John, who's with us um, most every week. Um, uh, Dennis D'Antoni Losowski, um, who is uh, an NP who's been working with us not only in ID clinic, but in our COVID operations. Um, I think everyone knows Amanda Roy, our phenomenal uh, ID pharmacist in the hospital, but she also helps us a lot in ID clinic. Alex, our schedule, and Grace, who is with us um, every week. And then just to thank um, the Ward 86 group, where we are physically located, um, and our ID um, fellowship program, because we get to work a lot with the fellows. So um, here is Dalba Vanson. Um, this is a, a really interesting antibiotic. So it's in the lipoglycopeptide class, and it works by inhibiting cell wall synthesis, like many, many do also has a secondary mechanism of action by disrupting cell, main perme cell membrane permeability. So this is uh, very similar, almost identical to the bactericidal mechanism of vancomycin. Um, but it is very different in this one way, which is that it is almost 100% protein bound in serum. And that feature gives it a very long half-life of almost 15 days. So one infusion creates a pharmacology where it's in your system for quite a while um, and allows for a dosing paradigm that can be once per week. Um, further, it has no real known drug interactions. It does not interact with P450 and it has no known nephrotoxicity. Um, and this was added to our hospital formulary in 2021. So we're currently about two and a half years into having this drug in our hands and using it for a variety of situations. So let me just tell you um, kind of, so how did this drug get FDA approved? It, 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 it was all initially approved for skin and soft tissue infections. Um, we're now using it for a much broader range of off-label indications, much more severe and advanced scenarios. And that's what I'm gonna talk about more. But just to show you that this was the original um, pair of registrational trials that the company did to get its FDA approval. Okay, so these were um, double blind RCTs a while ago. These were done in 2011, 2012, um, multiple international sites. They took adults with cellulitis, abscess, or wound infection. Those are kind of the three canonical categories when we talk about skin and soft tissue infections. Um, 
And these were patients who were judged to need at least three days of IV antibiotics, okay? Um, and they had systemic and local signs of infections. They could not have had antibiotics in the last 14 days. Um, and they randomized people to either a two-dose strategy of dalbavancin, so an infusion on day one, and then another infusion on day eight, because remember, it sticks around with good pharmacology for about a week, and compared that to a standard of care, which was vancomycin um, uh, for at least three days, and then investigator choice to switch over to oral therapy, to complete 14 full days. So this is a pretty long and aggressive regimen of orals. Um, a lot of SSTIs don't need that long of a treatment, but that's what how the trial was structured. Um, and you can see the primary outcome was an early clinical response defined as being afebrile and the spread of erythema being stopped. And in the first trial, um, the performance was, was very comparable with this two-dose strategy of Dalbavancin. 83% achieved that outcome versus 82 in the standard arm. Um, in the other paired trial, it was a little bit lower, but very similar uh, across the two arms. Um, they also measured end-of-treatment clinical success after the whole 14 days were up, and that was a, a very high cure rate seen in both arms. So what they learned from this study conclusion was that this two-dose strategy of Dalbavancin was non-inferior to 14 days of standard therapy. Okay, and then they quickly moved to the, to the next one because I mentioned you don't really need 14 full days of therapy for most SSTIs. So the next trial is just doing one infusion. And they did one infusion compared to two infusions. And just to short circuit this slide a little bit, again, primary outcome a little bit different here. It was reduction in erythema size, and that was achieved in 81% of the people who had one dose compared to 84% of the people who had two doses. The secondary outcomes that looked at cure at two weeks, at one month, were also quite high in both arms and equivalent. So this is the trial that really uh, shows us that one infusion of Dalbavancin um, can it achieve a high rate of cure and not inferior to two for skin and soft tissue infection. Okay. But that's not the main thing that I want to talk about today. I just want to give you that background. So what is very interesting about Dalbavancin is now there are, we have great therapies for skin and soft tissue infection, like oral Keflex, Septra, clindamycin. We don't need a $2,400 infusion of Dalbavancin in most cases. So, but where we do need it and are interested in is these off-label scenarios um, uh, for other conditions like MRSA bacteremia or MSSA, osteomyelitis, vertebral and spinal disease, um, and more specifically, syndromes where a plan of several weeks of IV antibiotics is not going to work well. So who, who would that be? So patients where you might want to prescribe two to six weeks of IV antibiotics and set them up in a skilled nursing facility, but they're not amenable to going. Um, or you could set them up at home for those IV antibiotics, but they are not able to self-administer. Um, situations where a pick line is thought to be not feasible. That's a, that's a lot of scenarios like that. Um, and folks that we serve who have, you know, dual challenges of substance use, mental health challenges, or housing uh, challenge. All of these are situations where our standard approaches um, don't work that well. Um, Sometimes, you know, the plan can be oral antibiotics over a long period, but of course we have a lot of folks where adherence will be difficult, um, especially when combined with the above challenges. So we are very interested in Dalbavancin um, potential for these scenarios. So let's look at quickly at two studies, evidence for this drug treating osteomyelitis, which you know is a bacterial infection of bone, um, that usually needs a long therapy, like six weeks or more. So here was a, one of the first uh, randomized trials with Dalbavancin, and they did a two-dose strategy um, and compared it to standard of care. Um, this was a, um, done in 2016 to 2017. Adults with osteomyelitis, um, with all the classic signs and symptoms, clinical, radiographic, and lab, like an elevated CRP, 
And they did either a two dose um, uh, regimen of dalbavancin. These are higher dose than what you would use in skin infections. This is 1500 milligrams and then repeat 1500 milligrams a week later. So the levels go up and before they've really come down, you hit with a second dose and you get to a, a higher peak level that lasts for six to eight weeks. Um, and they randomized seven to one, which is an odd, odd design, but got a very high cure rate. Their primary outcome was a six week clinical response, which was seen in 97% of the Dalbavancin arm, 88% of the standard of care arm. They also looked at an early clinical improvement outcome, and that was also high in both. And then they went back at six months and looked at clinical status and, um, they actually found that Dalbavancin had a, a better um, rate of having no recurrent infections and no further problems. So the conclusion from this study, this was just the first of several, um, was that two doses of Dalbavancin could be a good strategy and performed similarly to standard of care for osteomyelitis. And then you should always ask kind of like, what were the bugs in the osteomyelitis? What bacterial infections did these folks have? It was mostly gram positive from cultures and fully 60% of it was staph aureus. So the bugs that patients had were things that would be expected to be handled by Dalbavancin. Okay, and then the last um, study I'm gonna show you is this one. This is not an RCT, this was a retrospective observational study, but more recently, um, and this is from the United States. So this is adults um, with, again, classic osteomyelitis. This was mostly three quarters of it was lower extremity osteomyelitis. That's the most common location that we deal with and another 15% upper extremity. And they did the same thing. Dalbavancin times two doses, um, one week apart. And they looked at a primary outcome, the inverse, which is what was the incidence of failure? So this is a negative outcome rather than the last one, which was what percent were cured. And the failure rate was very similar in the Dalbavancin group to the standard of care group. So overall, again, this is um, showing similar performance. In this study, there was a lot less staph aureus. So they had a broader array of gram positive bugs. Staph aureus, most common, but they had a whole variety of other um, uh, gram positive agents here. Okay, so let me tell you quickly then about three patients where we have used Dalbavancin and just to highlight some of the issues. So this first one was a 35 year old woman who had end stage renal disease. She's on peritoneal dialysis, declining hemodialysis and had a lot of diabetes complications, um, including gastroparesis and nausea, making it difficult for her to take any oral pills. She had had foot osteomyelitis and already had one uh, amputation of a toe. This summer, she came in with leg pain, but also had an area very high up on the left leg that was swollen. And multiple things were diagnosed at the same time. So an ultrasound showed a DVT in the lower leg. A CT scan in the thigh area showed inguinal lymphadenopathy that looked necrotic. And then a CT scan of the left foot, even though she had had an amputation already, showed an area of osteomyelitis. So three different things going on. Um, she was started on empiric vancomycin. She had a biopsy of the lymph node in the groin and it grew MSSA, methicillin sensitive staph aureus. Um, so she was put appropriately on cefazolin, but the soft tissue infection in her thigh got a lot worse and continued to swell. And then a CT scan a few days later showed that it had flourished into a large abscess. So she was taken to the OR and had the whole thing incised and drained. So this is where we were. We have a complex MSSA infection, including osteomyelitis and necrotic soft tissue infection, and it's been operated. So she needs easily six or more weeks of antibiotics to handle this, but the, op the standard options we would think about are challenging. So, um, the renal team is trying to prevent the use of a vascular access catheter and does not want her to have a pick line because we're about to establish hemodialysis. We already said she has trouble taking oral pills. And we looked into the topic of doing peritoneal delivery, like putting an antibiotic into the fluid that she uses for peritoneal dialysis. But there is no data for doing this for an invasive serious infection like with staph aureus and the PK parameters there are uncertain. 
So do we send out the bat signal and call for Dalbavansen? That, that was the question on, uh, on the consult team. Um, and we decided, yes, that this was a good and rational use of Dalbavansen. So she got the two dose strategy, the high dose, 1500 milligram on day one. She got the second one a week later. And we were able to see her a month later in ID clinic. And she had complete resolution of the thigh infection. The foot looked great. Um, she was ambulating, was pain-free. So this was a, a clinical success. Um, okay, here's patient two, a 58-year-old man with polysubstance use disorder, diabetes, hypertension, and he had been diagnosed at CPMC with a very serious disseminated infection with methicillin-sensitive staph, bacteremia, but also um, quite bad spinal disease. He went to the OR at CPMC and had an incision and drainage of the spine, laminectomy, and he was sent to a skilled nursing facility for six weeks of cepazolin. That's an appropriate plan for this uh, agent. Unfortunately, he self-discharged out of the skilled nursing facility after about a week. So he had very inadequate therapy. He came here to our hospital another couple of weeks later, got admitted, was started on napsilin, um, and the medicine team was just getting everything started. Let's, let's scan him. Let's get a surgical consultation. Let's rebuild the plan from scratch. But he self-discharged from here from our hospital uh, 24 hours later. Another month went by where no one could contact him. And he came back to us now with persistent back pain that was worsening. And an MRI fortunately was able to be done and showed um, a lot of paravertebral and paraspinal infected tissue, phlegmon, and abscesses both in the L2 zone and in the L4, L5 zone, as well as in the psoas muscle and uh, other, other locations. So really still quite a bad infection. So here we are again, and the question is, we have a complex spinal infection with all these features. There was a long discussion with surgery, and unfortunately they came down uh, with the feeling that surgery could not be offered. We talked a lot about debridement, but there were anatomic features a lot of the disease was anterior to the spine. You know, that type of surgery is a lot more complicated than when the spinal disease is posterior. So the, the, the feeling was this patient, again, will need six to eight weeks at least of an antibiotic regimen, but we've already failed um, prior attempts at IV therapy. And the plan of putting a PICC line in and going to skilled nurse facility has failed. Um, and oral therapies, we were worried about adherence. Um, so again, do we think about Dalbavansin? Um, and we did. Um, so once again, remember for the spinal disease, you want the high dose strategy. So high dose, two doses. And we again saw this patient a month later in ID clinic um, and they had complete resolution of the back pain. Um, we were able to get an MRI in the outpatient setting and there was near complete resolution of all the phlegmonous areas and the only thing left was this one muscular abscess had shrunk, um, uh, you know, volumetrically about 80%. So interestingly, we were worried about that. You know, the paradigm in treating spinal diseases, if there's any soft tissue component to the infection left, we still, we want to continue treating. We have failures when even if you bring it down 90%, um, and there is still paravertebral uh, infection, we sometimes see recurrences. So we did something even more unusual, which is we gave a third dose of Dalbavansin. Again, this is not a described strategy, but due to all the challenges that, that this patient has, um, we delivered that. We followed this patient up um, later, um, another month later, and clinical care was achieved. Okay, and really quick, last patient. This was a 40-year-old woman, um, with hep C um, injection drug use, and she's cared for by the street medicine team. Um, we have a lot of interactions with the street medicine team who are an incredible group of folks. They are out there um, interfacing with a really wide range of patients who have a lot of trouble coming to clinic, coming to the ER, getting admitted. And these are folks where the things you wanna do, get an MRI, get a CT scan, assess them, reassess them, all of it very difficult. So they contacted us about this patient who was injecting into the left leg and developed an inguinal lymphadenitis. This is a pretty common situation. They started oral antibiotics, um, encouraged her to come in. Um, she did not. 
Um, several weeks went by and then a CT scan was done showing left hip osteomyelitis. So this is a, a really bad trajectory that this infection took. She was admitted, um, was taken to the OR for IND and culture showed MRSA. Um, and she was appropriately uh, prescribed vancomycin for six weeks and was discharged to a skilled nursing facility. This actually went pretty well. She stayed at the skilled nursing facility almost the entire time completed therapy, and we recommended her going on Doxy as an extension until we could get a new MRI and really make sure that things were improved in the hip because the original infection was quite bad. Um, two months later, the, so the Doxy never got started, <clears throat> and two months later, she had um, a suicidal ideation and came to a psych emergency services and was 5150. Um, during that few days, we were able to do another MRI. And unfortunately, um, as we had worried about the infection, not only had not gotten better, it had gotten substantially worse. So there was real erosion in the acetabulum and the bone um, and pyomyositis. The muscles were also involved. Um, so she had failure of, of a good six-week Vanco therapy that was observed. And maybe she needed more debridement up front, or maybe it was she just had too much disease burden in the muscles and other places. So again, so this will be the last patient we talk about, but it's the same thing, complex staff situation. We have failed a good therapy. Um, the 5150 was about to expire and the patient was clear they were wanting to leave the hospital immediately. Um, but, and they said they would take oral antibiotics, but we were worried about that. There was fluoroquinolone resistance, rifampin resistance, um, and we had already failed um, six weeks of IV vancomycin. So again, do we call for dalbavancin? Um, and we did. Um, so, but um, dalbavancin, so we gave the first dose in the hospital. Um, and interestingly, this patient had a really bad um, kind of total body skin pruritic reaction, just kind of itching all over the, over the body. And we thought this was possible Dalbavancin reaction. There was some controversy, but we made a plan to try to deliver that second dose a week later with some pre-medication and slower infusion. Um, unfortunately, they did not present to the 4C infusion center to get the second dose. And this is probably our number one logistic complication with Dalba. So everything I've talked about, you give two doses, but um, doing that strategy depends on giving the second dose. Otherwise you don't achieve that long pharmacology of six to eight weeks. So unfortunately, um, because this infusion was missed, patient was then readmitted with progressive pain. Imaging showed even more destruction and they underwent a girdle stone procedure, right? So the top of the femurs resected um, and they were put on daptomycin and um, uh, sent uh, back to a skilled nursing facility. This is a good plan. She clearly needs a more, you know, longer definitive therapy and discussions are going on about hip replacement. But the thing is gonna be, we need evidence that we have kind of cured, uh, you know, most of the really cured the disease in the hip before they're gonna put in a joint. So the lesson of this case where we had a problem was that um, Dalbavancin times two, the two high dose strategy really depends on delivering that second dose. And what we know from our data is this successfully happens about 75, 80% of the time, but maybe 20% of the time that we want to give two doses, the patient does not um, present for that second dose. So just, it's an 80, 20 kind of risk equation that we're taking. Okay. I would say these vignettes highlight a lot of ups and downs. I, sh I showed you two cases where we succeeded and one where we failed. Um, and we've had several, uh, like I said, many other patients who have missed dose number two, about 20%. And then we've had a couple of other interesting um, problems come up. One with um, uh, marked LFT abnormalities after a Dalbavancin inf infusion that got better on its own. Um, another patient who developed rash plus LFT abnormalities that we did ascribe to Dalbavancin. And although we've started to see some case reports about Dalbavancin patients having drug resistance, we have not seen this at San Francisco General thus far. And in our view of about 100 patients that we've given Dalbavancin to, we have achieved cure in about 80% of them, which I have to say, I think that's very good. Um, we want that to be 100%, and there's other implementation things 
to, to boost this. But these are patients with, um, who've either failed therapy or a lot of our standard maneuvers probably wouldn't work. So 80% is to me is going to be better than uh, what it would be with other standard approaches. And then this is a, just a quick snapshot of our SFGH Dalbavancin criteria. Um, these are available online. Um, so you want to have a patient with a serious gram positive infection, not a candidate for standard of care regimens, right? So a lot of judgment involved in this scenario, exploration of a scenario, exploration of what's possible logistically. I, I, I love this kind of stuff because I think you really have to get into it with the patient and their caretakers and where do they live and who, who else is in the network of people taking care of this patient? What can you make work? Um, and then we, this is all by ID approval, right? This is a $2,500 um, infusion that we need stewardship on. And we want to make sure there are not some of these exclusion criteria in the mix. So take a look at the bottom. Hard exclusion criteria would be CNS infection, infection with a VANC resistant organism because DALBA and vancomycin work the same way, history of a serious allergic reaction. But then in the middle here, we have a bunch of gray zone topics, relative exclusion criteria. And I'll, I won't go through these, but these are the kinds of things that we're wrestling with on the ID service. Um, and then we advise from ID clinic. So my one perspective on implementation uh, and design is that we have two things that we're trying to do. One is for the easy type of patient with skin and soft tissue infections, we're trying to create an emergency room pathway for patients who have a skin and soft tissue infection that instead of getting admitted to the hospital where the average length of stay for SSTI would be three to four days, they would receive a single Dalbavancin infusion in the ER and then just follow up with us in seven to 10 days in ID clinic so we can adjudicate the cure. Um, this is, you know, um, uh, about 7% of all patients admitted to medicine are admitted for some type of cellulitis or skin and soft tissue infections. So there's a lot of patients per year. Um, and not everyone should get the strategy, but a good chunk of them could get the strategy. Um, but a lot of design issues are there and funding is needed. The other thing we want to do is um, have um, uh, expansion of how we're using this with the ID consult team. And we're doing this with Amanda um, and all the ID attendings um, and kind of tracking uh, Dalva events and data. A uh, lot of emerging smaller studies and then there's several other RCTs going on. So that is all I have. Um, I included some references here and just to thank everybody um, who's working in ID clinic on this. And I'll, maybe I could take questions at the end. Okay. For now? Okay. Yeah, Gabe. Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, great presentation, Vivek. So that the day seven after you, you're seen in the ER, are you gonna proactively do things to ensure that people make that visit? Yeah, so the idea would be that on day zero and they're in the ER getting the Dalbavancin infusion. There have to be a package of things like an appointment has to get booked. It has to get printed. There has to be a map with a piece of paper. We're located in a very different building than the ER. There should be a transportation voucher. And then there should be phone number given to the patient so that they can't make it. Maybe somebody else can adjudicate. So there has to be, because even in the best scenario, we're already losing 20% of people for a second infusion. So like that, um, we would be worried that a lot of people may not show up, especially if they get better, which many will be very much better by day seven, but we need to see it um, with our own eyes. So um, yeah. I have two quick question points. And one we've discussed, which is just that for economic incentives, like financial incentives for that second infusion, you could put a pretty high price tag on that and still be cheaper than all these complications of not getting this infection cured. So it's like a great example where like a single uh, incentive, uh, eat cash, whatever, could be hugely impactful. It's just one point. The second, I was just curious about your thoughts on, we often get into situations where people have high grade bacteremia. I know you have those in the middle. Uh, and I was just wondering, looking at uh, Amanda, who I very helpfully shared with our team, cases of breakthrough infection with drug resistance, particularly cross-resistance to vancomycin, if I'm not mistaken, adapto as well, 
yeah. um, with Staph aureus. And that's obviously sort of the, one of the most feared concerns along with allergies. I was just wondering if you had any comments on what you would predict based, I know it's case reports, but like what, what's emerging in terms of our understanding of who is most likely to develop resistance for the strategy, particularly because I will just say is that this is an editorial comment, but it is kind of a path of least resistance times to get double. So we get a lot of calls on the ID consult service yep. where someone who actually could get IV antibiotics could go to a sniff, might be fine, you know, and you get kind of a push to say, well, can't we just give double because it's just a lot easier than the bureaucratic hurdles of doing the things you would do to normally get someone first line therapy, which is IV antibiotics. Thanks. Yeah. Um, th so there's three really great points there. I'm going to take them in reverse. So the last one, absolutely right. There is pretty broad knowledge about Dalbavancin. So not only we get asked a lot about Dalba because it's just one and done, just infuse, and then maybe I could discharge the patient right away. There's also like a frequent framing of this as like a harm reduction maneuver, like a situation where you've got concerns. Maybe we have relative contraindications. You're worried about the possibility of something going wrong. And then the team frames it to you as, but couldn't we just do it? it wouldn't, it, wouldn't doing it be better than not doing it? Harm reduction logic, which is tricky. So, I mean, cause we have to make sure we're not pushing into the zone where it's dangerous. So the zone where it's dangerous, like you said, High-grade bacteremia, like you've already had multiple blood cultures, it's not just admission day, but it's already day three or something, and they're still positive. And then just as a, a generally high burden of disease, that's where we're going to worry. And then if you have sensitivities on the staff and Vanco is at two rather than one or 0.5, more worry, just like we would worry a little bit about the vancomycin effectiveness would worry on. And then the incentives could not agree more, super well set up for a study where you give a singleton incentive upon arrival to the infusion center for the second infusion. You know, it's just, it's just, you, you show up on day seven, the uh, incentive is delivered. And then maybe we could reduce that 20% fail rate. Even if we reduced it to 15 or 10, it would be massively worth whatever the incentive money was. Because if one patient out of 50 has a failure and then gets readmitted and MRI and surgery and all that, it's easily paid for uh, the other hundred patients' incentives, obviously. So, uh, this is a great program that you're doing, and so appreciate it. Two questions quickly. One is the bone penetration, soft tissue penetration, um, skin and soft tissue infections are one thing, but but osteo is another. And then the second is um, was concerned what you said about resistance, and and I know it it would depend on screening, but what do you think the rate of resistance is, and how easy is it to become resistant to dalvavaxin? Yeah, so the bone pharmacology, there's people taking chips of bone after, in, after infusion. And if you do the two infusions and then take a chip of bone, you actually get levels that are quite a bit higher than um, inhibitory or bactericidal level. Um, and those are also present in bone chips taken even at week six to eight. So it's looking pretty good in terms of what we see in the lab. And then the clinical stuff is panning out. All these case series, mostly retrospective, people are just trying things, but the cure rates are looking pretty good. We're not seeing a big signal of like, oh, we tried this with osteo and it, and it didn't work out. Um, and then, um, sorry, your other question was, uh, resistance. Yeah. Few case reports have emerged right now and they've been of this kind of caliber, like high grade bacteremia. And um, you could see wobbles were there um, from the beginning. Um, I think the rate of resistance is very low. We, exactly, we haven't seen it yet. Not once at our hospital. We've now, we're probably treated 125 people with Dalbavancin or so. Yeah. Like recent treatment with Vanco, like an extensive treatment with Vanco things like that. So it is something to think about, like if the reason for Dalba is they've just failed an eight week Vanco course, that's, you know, something that, that should put a, I won't say red light, but it should put a yellow light, you know? Okay. I'll, I'll if no other questions. Yield. I'll ask one, one oh, last yeah, one. Thank yeah. you. Vivek. That's fantastic. You know, one challenge in, in getting folks to that second infusion is, is just like, yeah, meeting them where they are. Have there yeah. been conversations about providing second dose outside 4C, like at Methadone Clinic, Ward 86, other locations. So uh, another fantastic, obviously great idea. Um, we need some kind of mobile unit that can do more than just sub-Q or muscular injection. This will be an IV infusion, 
but we have great vehicles that are equipped to do this kind of thing and how to get a vehicle like that and put it into the right location. Because if we had one and there could be you know, well-chosen locations in the city that could, where that vehicle could be. And we could even have a team that just goes there for a couple hours and deliver the infusion and be done. Also because that second dose, not strictly at day seven, you could, you know, day eight, to 10, six to 11, there's leeway. You could maybe have a once a week clinic and then whoever needed that second dose go into that clinic, that kind of thing. So lots of ideas. Um, okay, I'll yield. Uh... All right. So we're going to shift gears a little bit to um, an infection that's not as common as osteo or MRSA bacteremia, but um, I'm sharing it because I think it um, will help inform your HIV practice. And it's a silent and silenced disease to be named. So um, this is a case I'm going to start with um, that was published in CID. It's not my, um, my uh, it's not a patient I saw, but actually quite similar to a patient I saw as a resident. And I think it will start this conversation. So she is a 38 year old woman. She immigrated from Honduras and she comes in with a 10 day history of progressive right-sided hemiparesis and headache. Other than those symptoms, she had a normal neurologic exam, normal mental status exam. Um, and um, as part of the workup, um, they sent an HIV test, which is great, but that comes back positive. Um, so she has a new diagnosis of HIV um, and her CD4 um, count is 104, viral load is 216,000. So of course, as part of the workup, you order an MRI. Here's the MRI um, showing bilateral rim enhancing lesions with extensive surrounding vasogenic edema and necrotic centers. Um, these are big lesions. Um, and you, as the experienced HIV uh, clinician, uh, uh, pulls up your differential for space-occupying lesions um, in a patient with HIV and low CD4 count. And of course, we um, very quickly go to our short differential of toxo or primary CNS lymphoma. And then I just included our longer differential of bacterial, fungal, parasitic, and malignancy. So you're thinking that. So what happens? Um, the patient was started uh, in, on empiric toxo treatment, um, but over time, the toxo serology comes back negative. She gets an LP, her white count is 80, it's lymphocytic predominant, high protein, normal glucose, and her CSF crag is negative. EBV serology is negative from a CSF, um, and she's looking a little bit worse. And given all of this, um, the, the team goes to a brain biopsy and we get an answer. So here's the histology from the brain biopsy and take a look. Um, this is just kind of for fun. Of course, we don't expect you to know a lot of these paths, but pull out your, um, the um, uh, uh, audience response. Let's see if it works. Um, so what, now given this, what is the cause of this patient's presentation? Is it MTB? Is it histo? Is it coxy? Is it uh, trypanosoma cruzi? Is it leishmaniasis? Or I like, literally have no idea what I saw. Um, okay, let's give a few moments. Uh, okay, so people are going for histo, people are going for T. cruzi. Um, a lot of people have no idea. That was what my answer would have been um, until I made this talk. So let's go, so what is the cause? Well, the answer is D, um, Chagas. Um, and um, I will just quickly walk through some of the paths. So MTB, of course, always high on the differential. She's from um, an endemic area um, from Honduras. Um, tuberculoma should be at the top of the differential, but no AFB, we have something else. Histo, for those who guess histo, this is a great guess. Um, and I just put a picture here. This is a picture of histo um, from a GI biopsy and it looks kind of similar, right? Um, and um, uh, often there's been many cases where things have been confused as histo. And this is a case report down here where we have um, a patient who presented with CNS Chagas reactivation. They thought it was histo and he died 14 days into admission and um, they found Chagas on, reactiv on reactivation. Um, so histo is close. Coxie, no spherules. Um, Leishmaniasis, not really consistent with the clinical presentation though the path can be um, similar. So um, here is just um, the diagnosis, which is T. cruzi re reactivation in the CNS. And you can see these nests of um, um, amastigos with darkly stained rod-shaped canidoplasts, which is really sort of um, a key feature of uh, uh, T. cruzi as well as leishmaniasis. And you can see I pointed here, and it's this complex, um, neat 
interlocking mitochondrial DNA that's unique to this, uh, the trypanosome sort of group. So I'm going to quickly run through CNS reactivation. It's not something we see very much, um, thankfully, anymore, but it's something to really keep on the differential, um, uh, especially with the right epi risk factor. And um, when we think about Chagas reactivation in immunosuppressed patients, um, CNS disease is actually the most common in um, patients who have AIDS um, and a CD4 count less than 100. Less common, we hear a lot about Chagas reactivation in, after transplant. This manifestation happens. Um, but it's not as common. Um, you can have meningoencephalitis with or without a mass lesion, so you don't need to have the mass lesion. Um, and the um, case fatality rate is quite high in case series up to 80%. Um, treatment, um, ART, antiparasitic treatment, and then there's um, very little published about iris, but some say none, one published a possible cutaneous case report. Um, the re other causes of um, CNS, our Chagas reactivation, just briefly, myocarditis is the second most common in um, patients with age, AIDS, and it can be fulminant or subtle. Um, and then think skin lesions. So erythema nodosum um, uh, happens. This is much more common in transplant. Um, uh, and um, if you biopsy it, you can see um, the mastigote. So very interesting. Okay, so that's uh, think reactivation. Keep it on your differential, rare, but um, um, important cause to not miss. So um, now you're in the hospital, uh, when would you start ART? Um, and not much data, but here, let's see what people think. So less than seven days after she's starting antiparasite, doing okay on antiparasitic treatment, wait two weeks. Um, let's kind of think more of it like a like crypto, maybe wait a little longer and wait five weeks. Okay, let's see what people say. Great. So um, I think I would probably lean towards B, um, like the 67%. I think if it's a large lesion, um, a lot of inflammation, I'd like to see some improvement and uh, just get the antiparasitic treatment working and start ART. Again, very little data. Um, and actually there's a lot of studies, case reports where they started ART pretty soon after antiparasitic treatment and um, uh, the patient did okay. So, um, Great, I, I, but I agree with B for now. Um, so what happened, so this is um, just to highlight, we ha actually have very little data. Um, and a lot of the data comes from Latin America um, in the pre and post ART era. This is from um, uh, uh, Argentina, looking at patients who are co-infected with uh, AG and um, uh, Chagas. Um, and react, uh, just bringing it up to say that of those patients, most of them had lower CD4s. Um, a lot of this comes from the pre-ART era, but um, Chagas reactivation was diagnosed in um, a large percentage of them. So it can really happen if you're co-infected and um, um, not on ART. Of course, everybody we see should be on ART. Um, so what happened to our patient? And this is a kind of whirlwind through this case, but um, she um, ends up um, uh, also having um, a PCR is positive on her peripheral blood and brain tissue. She was started, started on nifurtamox, which is another um, treatment for Chagas, um, and then started on ART four days later. Um, but unfortunately, after four days of ART, she developed decreased mental status and required intubation, and then sub subsequently developed staph aureus bacteremia, ventilator associated pneumonia, CMV reactivation, and um, worsening of, of that lesion uh, and subdural hematoma and died um, 54 days into starting therapy. So incredibly sad. Maybe it looks like there could have been an iris. Maybe there's just a lot of other stuff going on and we're just getting there too late. Um, so it's a sad case. Hopefully you'll always keep this on your differential. And um, I am putting this next slide here to say, let's rewind. Like, we are in the business of preventing this. Um, and so I'm gonna take you to case two, same patient, um, but she um, uh, was diagnosed in her, by her primary care provider um, and was started on ART by the RAPID team and is coming to you to establish care. Um, she has no other symptoms, her CD4 is high. This is what we, we wanna see. So um, let me take you through the remainder, the, the outline of the remainder of my talk. Um, and um, we talked about reactivation. We'll talk about um, next infectious disease screening for people born in Latin America um, and immigrated, um, discuss uh, the clinical presentation, when to screen and treatment for Chagas, 
I think these pictures are so fascinating here with this Trapana T. cruzia just ready to invade um, heart muscles, et cetera. Um, and then I also wanna just also start with my thank yous up front, um, Karen, Jeff, and Emily, uh, who have lent, um, given me some slides. They are my Chagas expert, Karen Byrne, who is at the Department of Epi Biostats as a worldwide uh, expert on Chagas and answers a lot of my questions. Jeff Whitman uh, is really working on um, uh, 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 increasing testing at, at ZSFG, which I'll talk about a little bit later, as well as Emily Kelly um, on in increasing testing and education. Okay, so back to our case. We're, we're gonna move quick. Um, so, um, in addition to checking your, her, your patient's HIV viral load, you're gonna get a QFT, hepatitis serologies. What other screening tests would you check with her next lab drive? H. pylori, B. schistosoma uh, IgG, T. cruzi IgG, Strongy IgG, or stool OMP, or A and D. Great. Great. So people are worried about that horrible presentation. <laughs> check check um, Chaga serology. Uh, and a lot of people are thinking about Strongy uh, and stool OMP. Um, okay, great. So I just wanted to walk through um, uh, some of the, the guidelines. So H. pylori, I check a lot of H. pylori in my patients from Latin America. Um, mostly it's triggered by um, uh, GI discomfort, concern for pe peptid ulcer disease. Um, and I think trying to think about screening higher patients who are higher risk is under discussion, but there's no current recommendation for universal screening. So it's not a routine test I do, but I kind of have a low threshold to um, uh, send it. Schistosoma, we get this in e-consult a lot. Um, just got one last week um, uh, of um, someone from Nicaragua who had, was schisto positive, and it was probably cross-reactive. It's not endemic in Central America. It is There is um, some schistosoma in Brazil, but mostly you're thinking about um, Asia and Africa, so I would not send that. Chagas, we'll get into this, but I would say yes. Strangi, I, I, yes, there's sort of mixed guidelines. Um, definitely send it for eosinophilia, anyone you want who's going to be uh, immunosuppressed. And I think it's um, um, uh, uh, helpful at the beginning. Stool OMP, usually if they um, uh, have symptoms. Okay, so this is my kind of short list. I also want to add and remind everyone to check um, uh, rubella, rubella, varicella serologies, um, especially if people don't have their vaccine histories. Um, and I do add on Chagas IgG. So um, let's move to um, uh, epi and transmission. Um, I won't get into this mostly due to time, but there's a fantastic history of, of, of Chagas. It's been um, with us for a long time, detected over 9,000 years ago in mummies in Peru and uh, Chile um, and discovered by um, uh, Dr. Carlos Chagas, who um, uh, is here. He named uh, the, he discovered the uh, trypanosome uh, uh, T. cruzii in this triatamine bug and named um, uh, it after uh, his mentor, uh, Oswaldo Cruz. Um, and I think he, you know, really great example of an advocate in his lifetime of um, addressing the social determinants of health um, uh, that really drive uh, this disease and was quite um, uh, very active politically and uh, with advocacy. And, and, for, and I think it's important to remember this is a silent and silent disease this is with WHO cause it because it's often asymptomatic and it affects the most vulnerable. Um, and despite it being known, we've known about it for hundred years, um, there's treatment, there's um, a lot of environmental interventions that can be done. It still um, affects many people. Um, this is the parasite, T. cruzii. This is the vector, the bug. We talked about the triatamine bug. Um, and um, I'm just gonna take a moment to talk about transmission. How is it transmitted? So again, vectorial, so the triatamine bug defecates on the skin after blood meal, and then um, the, par the parasites in the feces in the um, or urine of the bug, and it enters through abrasions in the skin. Um, and uh, it really likes to live in um, uh, sort of thatched houses, mud walls, lives in those cracks. And so a lot of the environmental interventions and um, um, spraying, it can be effective. Other mechanisms, transfusion, rare, we screen, transplant, a lot of movement in that area, um, Oral has been reported um, recently uh, and um, vertical transmission. Okay, so I'm talking about this potential for screening. Um, and so I think it's important to talk about um, uh, 
the epidemiology. Um, what would we expect to find if we screened in the United States? Um, and how many people does this affect? Well, um, this is a nice map from um, uh, Dr. Burns' uh, New England Journal article, great review. Um, and if, um, so Chagas um, in the Americas is estimated to impact 6 million people. Um, with the highest prevalence being in Argentina and Bolivia, I think of the patients that we see, we have a lot of patients who've immigrated from El Salvador and Guatemala, um, and those are the highest um, prevalence countries from Central America. Um, in the United States, there were recent estimates um, published. Um, so for people who um, were born in Latin America but live in the United States, um, an estimated 288,000 people have Chagas infection. And again, I listed... Um, uh, sort of the estimated prevalence um, based on um, country of birth. So Mexico is a little bit lower, 0.73%. Guatemala and El Salvador are higher at 1.9% and 1.1%. Um, and it's an interesting change in age structure. We're seeing it more common to older people um, likely reflecting um, gains in um, uh, uh, Chagas control measures. Um, but again, despite this, less than 10% of people have been diagnosed and only approximately 1% have received treatment. So let's do better. Um, and I think we'll get to the screening a little bit before that. Let's just talk about the clinical phases. And I think it's important for all of us to know the clinical phases if we're thinking about screening. Um, so with this, um, so the clinical phases of Chagas, it's extremely interesting. So um, you start with the acute phase, you get infected. Here's our, our uh, kissing bug, the tritamine bug. Um, and in, in the acute phase, you get developed symptoms within one to two weeks, can include fever, malaise, sometimes hepatosplenomegaly, but most of the time it's pretty mild. Um, you can get a skin nodule, which is a chagoma, and a painless eyelid edema, which is pictured here, Romagna sign, and that's actually the site of inoculation. Um, after the acute phase, um, your cell-mediated immunity sort of ramps up and controls parasite replication. So within eight weeks, um, you'll progress to the chronic phase. And there's two types of chronic phases. There's the indeterminate form, which is um, happens to about um, 70 to 80% go into the indeterminate form. It's asymptomatic, it's lifelong, and it can be diagnosed with serology. Um, 20 to 30% of people who are infected progress to what we call the chronic phase determinant. And that is with the end organ damage. So uh, impacts on, um, uh, so cardiomyopathy uh, uh, and the gastrointestinal system. So um, uh, this just highlights um, some of the, just takes a spotlight on the chronic determinant Chagas. Again, Chagas cardiomyopathy impacts the conduction system, can cause heart failure, and then um, uh, um, uh, ultimately lead to um, uh, uh, ventricular aneurysms and thromboembolisms. Um, gastrointestinal chaga, way, way less common um, and impacts, um, causes motility disorders, achalasia, and megaesophagus. Okay, so what, is, what do we do for testing? What should we be doing in our primary care clinic um, for our patients with HIV who were born in uh, Latin America? I'm gonna make testing extremely um, simple. It is actually quite complicated, but um, basically testing now is a, you would send a T cruzy IgG, it's a send out. If it's negative, you're done. If it's positive, um, you need to send it to, um, for confirmatory testing. Um, this usually goes to the CDC. Please contact Vivek and I from uh, NID clinic, we can help and the ZSFG lab will arrange. Um, but this is some of the most exciting news. Um, uh, we are bringing, and Jeff Whitman, I think he's either online or here, is bringing Chagas testing in-house. So we're making testing much easier. Um, so as we know, Chagas serology requires a multi-step algorithm. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, uh, you send the blood to uh, ZSFG. They'll run an automated ELISA platform, run two tests in tandem. If both positive in situation A, you have Chagas. Um, if they are different, these two tests, then it will send be a send out to the CDC um, uh, for a tiebreaker. So Chagas testing is about to become much more simple in January. And we thank um, Jeff uh, very much for spearheading this. Okay, so back to our HIV clinic, what are the guidelines? Um, and here are two sets of guidelines. One is the first is from the US Chagas Diagnostic Working Group. And again, it's kind of simple um, one or more risk factors you screen. And these are risk factors in order of importance, born or lived in uh, more than six months in an endemic country. 
have a family member with Chagas disease, lived in a house of natural materials, um, or being bitten by kissing bugs, or finding your, a kissing bug in the home. And um, the DHHS OI guidelines, which was just, this was updated in 2023, also recommends screening um, for individuals who have lived in Mexico, Central America, or South America for greater than six months. Um, so, what, so tips for the HIV primary care provider, screen the people who, live, who um, were born or lived in um, uh, continental Latin America greater than six months. Um, we're happy to answer questions. Um, and then I um, added um, uh, this article that we sort of uh, uh, wrote to try to advocate for screening at entry to care or catch up testing. So what happens? You send a T-Cruz IgG, it returns positive. You submit an IDE consult for help. Um, and you get confirmatory testing that it returns positive. So um, what's next? Well, of course you send her, send her to ID clinic, we're happy to treat, but here's what you can talk to the patient about. And this is, um, you know, we don't screen unless we're gonna treat and here's treatment, sort of a simplified guide. So there's two antiparasitic treatments, benzonidazole and nitrofurtamox. Um, and in the US, benzonidazole um, is Luckily, you used to have to get it from the CDC and do an IND, but now it's FDA approved for um, Chagas disease in children, but you can use it off label for um, people who are uh, for adults. Lots of side effects, um, which is why um, it takes a lot of support to get through some skin side effects, some nausea. Um, uh, and then I think neurologic side effects are what we've seen the most in ID clinic, headache, peripheral neuropathy, and then monitoring for hematologic effects. So who do you treat? Con uh, I put it in yes, maybe no. Yes, it's kind of straightforward, acute, congenital, reactivation like our first patient, and then chronic indeterminate chagas if you're less than 50. So that's your asymptomatic form. Um, I put maybe for adults over 50. I think this is mostly a shared clinical decision-making, no hard age cutoff, um, and we certainly treated patients over 50. Um, I think there's a maybe with mild cardiac chronic chagas, and then a no for uh in pregnancy, usually wait, and then um, for advanced chronic chagas, um, uh, there's no uh, no benefit based on a, a nice RCT. So um, we have a lot of um, treatment. Uh, we're waiting for a lot of um, more data, data on different dosing, biomarkers for therapeutic response, and understanding the host. So just to conclude, um, your patient is started on benzonidazole. She develops a rash. Um, she has some other, um, uh, you know, uh, adverse effects from the medicine, neuropathy, headache, but with support, she completes her 60 days of treatment. And I will, um, since we're low on time, I will just um, say we've done a huge tour through Chagas and hopefully um, we will feel comfortable integrating screening in your practice um, and um, remember um, uh, uh, the clinical phases for people with HIV and um, with low CD4. Majority of infections are silent. Let's prevent uh, disease and um, treatment is available and can prevent severe complications. And that's it. Thank you so much, Karina. That was great. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Thanks. That was wonderful. Um, just a question, maybe not that specific to Chagas, but uh, would have been have been a role for steroids in that CNS um, case, the first case that you presented? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, probably, um, I think if you're just in such a data-free zone, I probably would have, you know, depending on what was happening on imaging, if there was a lot more inflammation, I probably would have considered adding it and treating it more like an iris. But um, um, I think it's, it's, un it's unclear. And I think the other challenges with that patient, there were so many other, you're just getting there so late. There was CMV, there was just so many things going on that I think probably contributed to um, worsening to, to the to the death. And so prevent highlighting prevention is a, the key thing here. Yeah. Um, we are uh, um, screening a lot in OB clinic at this point, because I feel like that's such a um, Yes, low hanging fruit. It is definitely low hanging fruit. Um, I think overall screening across the board is extremely low. I, I think I imagine. I don't know what the data is in OB, but um, I imagine it's probably better than what we do here. And in part, it was it's because confirmatory treatment was really hard. 
Um, we used to have to go to the CDC. Um, screening, testing was a little bit challenging. There was a point where CDC stopped doing confirmatory testing during COVID. So there's a lot of challenges and it was hard to get the drug, but I, but I think now we're sort of reinvigorating it and trying to uh, increase testing. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting this. In no way have we um, emphasized this at Ward 86 at all. And right. when I was um, last in Brazil with HIV physicians, it's like a common, you know, I mean, you just, it's like a yeah. Y prevention. And so um, I'd like to work with you later about how to systemize this yes. for our, for immigrants um, from these regions at our clinic, because I think we're missing Yes, I think so. that yes. first case was, it was important that you started with that first. Yeah, I case. think it's like we, we need to not be afraid to test we, and treatment is available. And I think in 2024, um, that is, I think it's an initiative. And, I, and Jeff and Emily are really working on that across ZSFG, especially with the um, in-house testing, which is going to make things so much easier, so much faster. And so I think this is something we can really push forward in 2024 and, and um, more to come. That was a great presentation, Karina. Thank you. I was curious, any issues of cross reactivity of the antibody, like how specific it is to Chagas is one thing, and then the other is, um, is more logistical, but in Epic, is it a miscellaneous order or is it? Is, it you can you actually know, just type Chagas. in Chagas. Great, thanks. Um, and that will give the, um, uh, and that one right now goes to Arup. Um, so if you're doing it now, type in Chagas and it will go, I don't know. Oh, I see Jeff in the background. He may be able to um, speak about January and cross reactivity, if we have a moment. But the test in general is not, it, it, you know, you, that's why you need confirmatory testing. You can certainly see false positives. And so it's, we had a case from ID clinic, a man with achalasia who had an IgG positive, but then when we did confirmatory testing, was multiply te test negative and totally unrelated. So, yeah, that would be Jeff, if you want to come at the degree. So, our question yeah. from the chat is about the test characteristics, yeah. sensitivity and specificity in the setting yes. of, of, you know, prior exposure. Hi, thanks. Uh, so, leishmaniasis historically has cross reactivity with T. cruzi antigens and they can co occur. However, the clinical like syndromes that you'll see are per, can be separate. And then, and while there hasn't been extensive cross reactivity testing, this has many mainly been for 510k clearances for FDA. A, a, the leishmaniasis that they've tested, leishmaniasis samples, don't necessarily cross react. They're, historically, yes, but I'd say it's probably of less concern in, in in these days. But you should be aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, what, what was the other? If there was another question I could answer. Right? Oh, I sensitivity and specificity of the IgG testing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really great question. Overall, I think. Um, we, we actually are too hard on, on sensitivity and specificity. The tests we're looking at are in, in the high, in the nineties, the high nineties, but because of the overall low prevalence and how you structure screening epidemiologically, a 98% specificity can be really detrimental, which is why we say there's, we, we need to follow up with confirmatory testing. However, this is something that's being talked about right now. And it's like, can we get to an era, an era of better tests where we don't have to do this confirmatory testing? But right now I'll say sensitivity and specificity is high, but because of the disease epidemiology, we have to think about it as, as like, oh yeah, you're gonna have much higher false positives um, to true positives if you screen in a general population. We are over time. Thank you both so much for a phenomenal last session of the year. Thanks everyone.